I find um, there's a connection between um, Ewan's call for personal truth and um, AI. In a, well, you can find connection to anything, a bit to, with anything to AI because it's such a fundamental thing. But the, the call for personal truth is um, both um, personally relevant, it's grounding, it's centering, and also it's a reminder that in the face of the data, facts, information, it reminds us of the fragility of um, eternal truth. Um, and it also reminds us of the person um, behind or in front of the data and the facts. I think the, the problem, I, I, my background, what I do in London is quantified self. It's one of, the, one of the things that, one of the movements that deals with personal data and people I have spoken at um, State of the Net about this before. And it's about people collecting data about some aspect of their lives. And I find it fascinating that of all the technologies that we have, increasingly more personal, we don't really own our data. Our data is becoming more and more aggregated um, in the cloud somewhere. And artificial intelligence, as in machine learning, is coming at that data from that perspective. So the personal truth and AI, where's the, where's the overlap? Personal truth is useful. It's extraordinarily important, but it doesn't, it, it, it starts breaking down when it comes to making decisions, when it actually has the, the practical thing because it runs against somebody else's personal truth. Um, in, and that's why we have right and wrong and moral codices that tell us how to decide. And then we are back to the aggregate level. We're back to something more than the individual. Artificial intelligence is about making decisions. That is what it comes down to. The fascinating research that we're seeing, it all comes down to the fact that AI is much better at analyzing and understanding data, uh, drawing conclusions and making decisions based on that. And eventually it will make decisions about us in a way that will affect our lives to the point of being able to extinguish our life in order for it to be useful in any sense. So where do we, what's the vantage point? What's from which we look at these things? And I think the personal truth hides that vantage point, which is from the point of the individual. We need to go back with the data and facts and information to the level of the individual. So from the quantified self perspective, which is uh, not really a whole one, it's just a little corner of it, um, why can't we have algorithms of our own? Why do we look at aggregate data, big data, apply fantastically sophisticated and advanced techniques? That's going to happen anyway. But I would like to see personal algorithms, our own AI butlers, yeah. <laughs> help us. And that, that is, so every time I get confused and overwhelmed, so far it's worked for me, I snap back to the individual perspective. What, what does it look like from where I am standing? And that is not narcissistic, it's not self-centered. I think it's a foundational point that will then allow us to build to a much bigger point of society, culture, whatever we want. So it's a bit longer than I intended, but <laughs> let's have at it. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's interesting, but when I described it as personal truth, I was trying not to, I didn't mean uh, individualized or, or subjective in the sense that I think that implied. Um, but in our ability to make decisions does come down to us reaching a point yeah. of having whatever modest agency we do and making a decision as to what to do with that. Now, I agree. Well, I swing wildly. I mean, sometimes I think that I would trust some cleverly written algorithms over experts in increasing circumstances. I, I think it's a much better foundational point than... And I think patterns of individually... I think assistive technologies are really interesting. So number crunching that will help me rather than make decisions for me, I yeah. think are interesting. While you were describing that scenario, I was thinking of Kevin Kelly's book, which is called What Technology Wants. And he postulates the idea that with heuristic technologies that are learning faster than we are, printers that can already print themselves, uh, our ability to print biological parts of animals or whatever, that, e that technology is on its own evolutionary path. And that if we are, as some people have suggested, simply carriers for DNA, what do we get 
what do we do when we get to the point when DNA reckons that technology is a better bet than we are and jumps ship and we're just this dead meat that, that's left? Now, that's a, a clearly extreme scenario, but we're sort of but it probably happened. playing with it. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Okay, we discussed about that uh, at coffee time, and uh, I'd want to be pragmatic. This kind of network, though, this kind of artificial intelligence, is just only a parameter tuning. Like uh, if you use a washing machine and you 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 put wrong parameters, uh, your T-shirt become red instead of blue. So the the problem is exactly the same. I think that I, I'm sure that in a few years, uh, every one of us will have a special additional brain. Uh, is something that we call human augmentation. If you look at the Garner uh, Eap cycle, uh, the human augmentation point is very close uh, to, to, the, uh, to the top of, of that. So in the next future, probably, uh, Many of us will have in the smartphone a neural network that is able to remember better to, uh, to do something for your own data. And this would be uh, correctly something that we can do because also every one of us produce big data. Every day we think, we use, we touch something, we remember something. But at the same time, of course, if we give wrong data to a system, of course, the result will be not ethical, not correct, uh, and everything. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, I'm very optimistic of the fact that, that the future will be from one side, that, that problem or that opportunity of global intelligence, uh, enormous network of data connected together, and probably uh, in the hand of few people, or probably in the hand of government, and. Uh, or, or many other, and the others part personal intelligence. I think it's worth pointing out, I might have sort of overstated things. Uh, when I meant AI will eventually, well, in order for it to be useful to us and free us from drudgery and all sorts of things, it will have to be able to kill us. And I don't mean in a kind of iRobot way in, in terms of going crazy or getting cut, cut loose. It's just simply that there are always situations where um, either the situation has no positive um, decision, there's no, just damn if you do, damn if you don't, and we as humans haven't really solved that problem either. And we sort of fudge, we get along, we sort of accept intuitively and instinctively decisions. We have codes, we have all sorts of ways of dealing with those dilemmas. Uh, some, sometimes we don't, we just live with the, the, the tension and the pain that comes from that. Um, when, when a, a machine starts making decisions like that, we, I don't think we are ready for it. So the idea is that we are mindful of those kind of parameters that we put in, as you point correctly. It is the, the same principle. Uh, it's not some sort of black magic. Uh, it might be black box, but not black magic. And um, so we start thinking about it now so we don't get caught up later on and, and actually discredit, unnecessarily discredit AI when it's, it's a positive thing. Oh. <laughs> I don't know, no, I completely agree with you, so there is nothing to say. Uh, starting from my first picture, I say that my cat is intelligent, but I don't know if my cat has an ethic that is similar to mine ethic, so uh, we, cannot, we cannot ask to a dog uh, to have our uh, sense of the humanity, or probably as other rules. And if we are able to, to teach, uh, to train uh, this system to have our rules, probably they will work uh, as we want. Uh, if we don't, uh, of course not. Yeah, no, well, I just have, um, well, my issue is I'm not so interested in me, <laughs> to be honest, and in measuring what it could be doing for me. But I think, what can we do in terms of what kind of input we can put to actually lower um, the gaps that you have in a collective, in a community, right? So what you can actually, where you can actually use this kind of system to really improve a collective well-being, not so much an individual one. So, and that's where I have a problem, which I have no. How, how do you? How do you? How would you go about that? What? What? Exactly. <laughs> I, I I really don't know how I'd go by that. But talking about the input you put, like 
From a cultural point of view, I am interested in the community development, not so much in my personal way of solving a problem, right? So I wouldn't know how to get yeah. there because the problem is which kind of input you select to put yeah. there and how you make sure that the people are ready and able to be engaged in, in feeling that that kind of problem solving is actually uh, answering their problems, collective problems. I don't know if it's clear. Uh, okay, this is going to sound strange, but what is a collective problem? Is well, it, I mean, com component parts of a community is a human being, is yes. an individual. Yeah. And, oh, okay, there are many schools of thought about what community and, and society is, but for, for me, for my, my personal truth, is that it's an emergent property of individuals uh, interacting and yeah. behaving in a certain manner. So a collective problem is a bit of a misnomer in my book because it's... It, it is an emergent property of individual problems. But, but isn't, isn't that just the issue that, you know, I often write about the ideology of algorithms. There's no such thing as a neutral, apolitical algorithm. Whoever writes it has a context, has a worldview. And if you wrote it, you might have a different set of priorities in the algorithm than somebody else who's got a different philosophical worldview. Right. And I think that's one of the things we're sort of stumbling into. I mean, it was interesting listening to Lillian this morning that I think she's right, that we are sort of allowing Silicon Valley with its particular worldview and perspective to have disproportionate influence over how the community or whatever we define it as operates. And, and we're sort of sleepwalking into that, you know? Yeah, I, I agree completely. Yeah. yeah, I'm not saying, I mean, obviously, it really depends on whatever, your social culture, your, you know, where you come from and all of that. What I'm saying is, in terms of interest for me, yes. the application, the interest is if we can find a way to engage, let's say, different um, expectation, inputs, way of thinking in order to find a solution to a problem which will affect a community. For example, how to improve uh, local environment. Let's say local. I'm not even talking about global also because uh, it's pretty obvious in what I say that we, if you talk global then it becomes very difficult. But I find it very difficult at the moment even to find uh, what is called the common good, right? To define that and to get some sort of um, tools and application that can actually improve the common good, not so much the individual good. So that's really my, my issue there. What kind of inputs should you put in order to be able to improve the common good? Which I have no answer for, <laughs> really. Yeah, it's not a technology point. It's exactly. not a technology not problem, only, absolutely. Not only. No, no, the, yeah. that uh, I would like to, to explain that now is not a technology problem. Now it's a problem of decision that the people have to do, depending on the topic, and depending on the goal, and depending on the objective. So I'm sure that now money, uh, if there are money enough to do something, but I'm sure that there will be in the future. It depends on the political uh, uh, ideas, uh, of the social idea we have, that we have to carry on. And so I think that uh, the possibility we will have will be a lot. And we have just only to exploit in the better, in the... Yeah. The, in a better manner, so this is something. But equally, when we were chatting earlier, you were saying there are already examples of technologists <coughs> having to make decisions that will have impact beyond simply technology, but they don't have support, I guess, in order to make those decisions better. Yeah, it depends on what uh, do you think about the word decision. So, because... Uh, I think that uh, now the system can help you to take part of the decision, to, to support your classification, to understand something about data. Like, for instance, uh, this morning or yesterday, you discussed about uh, uh, anal data analysis uh, in the wild and so on. So these are new techniques that can be used as a support of decision. But, of course, the support of the decision can arrive till the final decision. So if a robot uh, has to take something there or something there, this is the decision that uh, influences and affects also the motion of the arm. So you can arrive until there. Probably you can also say that uh, you have to take this stone and put it in, uh, in the face of some, someone or do something else. It depends on what is the final intention. So uh, it's a step-by-step -step system. And I think that uh, it's very important that now we are in the loop and then we can uh, 
now another word that is very common is cyber physical system is another fashion word that we are using. A cyber physical system are more simply for us a, a system where in, uh, 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 in the system there is also the human or some cyber part and some physical part that are working together. And I think that this is the time that uh, there should be not technology in one side and person in another, but we have really to stay together to decide that. I think it's sort of evidence of how far-reaching AI is that we're talking about nature of community, we're talking about um, the nature of ethics and moral dilemmas. And um, I think when we, from what you were, you, you were right to point out, we sort of we still in very early days. The fact that AI has been around for decades it means almost nothing, other than a lot of different strands seems to be coming together. So it will accelerate. And for me personally, the um, what humans can do is focus on the input, on the parameters and understanding. Because by the time we get to the decision making, we, I don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think we can redo the decision making of the, of the machine. We will have to accept the decisions because it, we will not have enough time or capacity to, to check every decision. Uh, so for example, medical diagnosis, um, the IBM, Computer Watson is already much better, well, has higher rates of successful diagnosis than human doctors. Um, the idea, I think, intuitively, a lot of people think, we'll let the machine tell us what it thinks and then we make our own decision. That's not sustainable. That, at some point, we'll have to let the machine decide. And that's when it becomes uh, very interesting in terms of impact on something as personal and, and deep as health. Well, I've got a friend who has a chip uh, implanted in California and at the moment it's just monitoring and, and improving the quality of information being given to the system mm -hmm. but it's not a big step to imagine that chip injecting the appropriate drug you know what why wait for the visit to the doctor if you've trusted the system enough that it will start to do that yeah yeah so I think but at the same at the same time as a good uh, uh, medical personal scientist uh, uh, doesn't finish to study and continues to learn more, uh, also this kind of systems can improve themselves uh, because having new data, understanding the errors. So, so I think that uh, is the same process we have in many other things. Uh, so also, uh, also if you go in an hospital and you have just only with the human doctors uh, and they do an error, probably they will not do the same error, but unfortunately with another person, not with you. So uh, I think that there is no difference from my point of view of that. What we have to do is take care of that, uh, not to, to neglect uh, that this is a problem. I think the personal perspective is even more important in um, to avoid what I call the sort of HAL problem or HAL uh, situation where the, the, the computer is programmed or the intelligence is programmed to achieve a certain goal and it has sufficient autonomy to make decisions in order to, to achieve that goal. In um, Hal's case, it was to exterminate the crew. Um, and that, he was just following, not his orders, he was actually making decisions based on the ultimate goal. And I think that, to me, is fascinating, uh, not just as a movie, but as something that we have to acknowledge, that if we do not understand, if we do not think about the implications um, of subjecting individual interest to the common good or goal, overall goal, that's where, that's how we operate. We sort of get by, not actually very well if you look at human history, but this is becoming even more important to see, um, to, to, to fully appreciate the relationship between the individual and the collective and to what extent that one can be subject, subjugated to the other. Because the machines will do it for us by default, because it is optimizing, because it works, because it's utilitarian. So what other moral framework? So is, is, it's interesting because in a way that's what evolution is, is the repeated experimentation, adaptation, biologically, yeah. And are we in a situation where we're not as good at it as the technology is, which is what you're sort of mm -hmm. 
extrapolate. But the moral framework is implicit. Is it, because we, yeah. is it because we try and get in the way of, we, we get yeah. in the way of evolution with our big ideas. Yeah. Yes, yeah. We learn too. We, we work the same adaptive way. And therefore, some of the things are implicit. We don't even realize that we haven't actually yeah. make them explicit. But, but we, we, therefore, we cannot include them in the parameters for AI or AGI or um, the machine. <laughs> so I think that... To me, that's something we can do as humans. It's a very different kind of pursuit from algorithms and, and the technology, which is going to happen anyway. Um, but that, that, to me, is something we can do um, before our robot overlords take over. I'm just thinking, this is the last panel in the conference. We better end up on an optimistic note. <laughs> no, no, no. I think, I think AI is fantastic. I want AI to bring post-scarcity. You know, we, we don't have to work. We just sit and talk. <laughs> I just want to add something from, we discuss about that, uh, but really for us, it's just natural. Probably most of you have an iPhone and Siri is fantastic. Siri understand your language, understand what, not only Siri, it's the same uh, in Google or the same Cortana in Microsoft and probably is better. But so the natural language processing, understanding the voice, understanding the, it's, just something that is working and nobody of us uh, are caring. If the system doesn't understand you, you say him stupid. How many of us probably taking the phone and say, you are not able to understand, you are stupid. So we use exactly the same word we use with humans. So I don't think that we are so far of that kind of things. Uh, is, uh, okay, uh, probably, I'm really biased of the fact that I use the system and computer all my, in all my day, but uh, I think that uh, we know that it's something different. Uh, it's completely different to stay with the person and stay with the software. It's completely different to spend all the day in Facebook or stay, spend all the day with friends. But we cannot say to our, uh, uh, our son, our daughter, that this is not the kind of... Uh, I know, friends uh, is another thing, so, so we have to, to deal with and to stay with them uh, because this is now in the life, I think. Is it, is it a bit like um, the fact that we still want pilots to be sitting at the front of the plane, yeah. but we're still nervous about control, and, and I'm True. less afraid of things that I feel, even if I don't have control over, I feel as if I can do something. Yeah. I'm less afraid of that than of something that just seems completely out of my... It's why terrorism is so effective, because I can't do anything about it, and that's yeah. what really scares me. It, it, is, it is scary, yeah. but, but actually, I think it will become more scary. Right now, I think we could look at um, things that in everyday life use AI, and it's not that great, actually. I mean, I, I'm, I'm told, like, I was just the other day, I was looking at Google News, thinking, why can't it just learn? from how I'm using it. It's really, it's really annoying having to, you know, and we spent, I don't know, I mean, I have several um, applications that I sort of train and, and, and keep correcting it, and it just doesn't learn. So right now, I don't think we have much to be scared about, but your point is absolutely valid, because it will, it will happen. Um, then what? But what do we, I mean, the truth is, we have control systems that we don't understand already. Um, but we hope someone somewhere understands them. I think that's the point. With AI, I think there will be nobody who will fully understand what's going on. Now, does it matter? Who is, knows? Is it better having Trump in charge or some machine that... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that, that's, that's the point, I think. It's depending on who owns the system, yeah. how open they are, how transparent is the entire process, how involved and engaged are the people in defining, for example, what goes into the system. Because I'm thinking again, I mean, I know it's much less impacting now, thinking back, but like the biotechnology revolution, when it was brought forward, was supposed to be something extremely impacting, right? And it has been, absolutely. But the fact that a big part of that has been completely privatized and completely brought into a field which has no public interest, I always go back there, but really, it has kind of lowered the impact that it could have had, for example, on public health. So yeah, I do think there is a lot of the process of governance of the technology that makes a difference in what kind of future it will develop and how relevant it will really be our relationship between the technology and us. In a way, I wouldn't be too scared because the kind of AI we have now is not going to go sentient. I mean, the whole point is that the parameters that we put in 
is the scariest bit, is not understanding connection yes. between the outcome and, and what we put in uh, fully. Uh, when it, I think if AI goes sentient, it's going to be a different kind of AI. That's just my private opinion. I mean, the, the, it's, it'll be a different evolutionary curve. Um, I may be wrong, but that's, no, no, you are not wrong. that's what no. seems to me. Um, so that, that, that's a different conversation we can have when that happens. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> I did a, I did a microphone boy. Now, come on, you must have. Okay, I have. Of course, it's a stupid question. <clears throat> One of the um, Facebook pages that I run has asked me twice in the recent days uh, whether my place has an address. And the suggested corrupt, um, amendment was no. And I had to put something against the fact that that correction was wrong. I had, I have an address, dear Mr. Zuckerberg. I want to tell you, this is the first thing. And the previous thing was, <clears throat> your web page doesn't have any website. Is it real? I said, no, of course. But it, twice, something artificial suggested wrong facts to me. If, if I hadn't done something, the whole wide world would have known that my website didn't exist and my places didn't exist. Is this artificial intelligence or this private property? I, I, I take comfort from the fact that Facebook continually adver advertises self-administered catheters to me because it means the AI is not that smart. But I also worry about what Facebook knows about my future that I don't. <laughs> um, Facebook was very consistently uh, recommended Hebrew lessons to me for six months. Really? Uh, so. <laughs> <clears throat> of course, there is also artificial stupidity, not only artificial intelligence, but this is something in general. <laughs> yeah, we could say natural stupidity beats artificial intelligence any time, I think. Is <laughs> Any other thoughts, idea, questions for our panel? Worries? No, don't think yeah, there worries. is a question there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was just wondering, how can AI become smarter than humans when humans are um, essentially what drives the parameters of AI? You have to answer? I really don't know. No, I think that uh, the computational power that can we have, uh, that uh, we can have in computers is higher than uh, the neurons we have in our brain. So it's obvious that for many things, uh, of course, computers will be better than us. They are still better, for instance, if you have to do some multiplication of big numbers. You know, that uh, every stupid CPU is able to, to do uh, addition or multiplication better than us. So I think that in this case, in the same manner, probably there will be many problems in artificial, in computer vision, in, in natural language processing, in data analysis, where a machine will be better than us. And there is, um, there is no, no chance about that. Even the parameters uh, um, uh, are coming from humans, the computational power is higher, so we have nothing to do about that. What we can do is try to control the, the system and the process in such a manner or to, to improve the technology. But uh, it's not a problem that we have to, uh, we can answer differently. The, the computational power that is in our brain is limited. The computational power that are in computer now in, such, in many cases is higher. Stop. But. <laughs> I think the, 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 the um, I think part of the challenge is we haven't really defined what consciousness is, and even for ourselves, you know, and our brains aren't just computational engines. If that's all they are, then yes, the computers will probably end up winning, um, and it's quickly you get into sort of woo-woo spirituality and all sorts of interesting stuff that's been around for millennia. But what does it mean to be human and what, what aspects of human consciousness go beyond logic and, and the meatware? We haven't really answered that. 
There are a couple of things on that one. I think um, artificial intelligence, if we ever can build a brain, neural networks have very little to do with human um, neural networks. That this is just the name. Uh, it's a confusing term. And one thing we, I think we can do is not to confuse artificial intelligence in any sense with human intelligence. It, it's, it's a big mistake that the media and the, the, the popular culture um, so it, it is the anthropomorphication of, of AI, which is a big, big issue, I think, that um, unless you understand how AI works, most people tend to, I, I used to before I got into it. And the second thing is our brain is not the most efficient way of achieving, of, of a processing uh, machine. It, it's just evolved, it's got lots of redundancy, it's got um, bits missed, and we don't even understand that. So artificial intelligence, is something fundamentally different. It's almost, it's alien, really. Yes, question and maybe comment. Uh, we are comparing artificial intelligence with individual human brains. Now, from my understanding, at least since 50,000 years ago, we decided to become a social organism. And in becoming a social organism, we decided to share the brains of larger and larger groups of humans. Now, with the internet, that obviously is helping, but we are acting as a social organism. Also, termites in the old days were not a social organism, then they became a social organism. The same happened to humans. Now, I think in the whole debate we have in the last two days, this part, uh, was a bit absent. And also, you know, the part related to the interaction between the, the individual brains of these social organisms and the, in, uh, the artificial intelligence must be taken into account. Because, you know, the brain with those neurons that you are mentioning, as you know, is a very plastic device and it changes according to the tools that you use, or if you, if you start speaking language, or if you start writing things, or if you start using internet, your brain will adapt. If you start delegating machines with tasks, your brain will adapt to this fact that you are delegating machine with these tasks. So I think we need to factor in these parameters. Probably that means that we have to broaden the debate from the knowledge that we have in this room to the knowledge appearing in people studying complex systems, networks, uh, neuro systems, and so on. So if you have a comment on this dimension, please. Can, 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 yeah, I mean, because uh, this is a, Dave Snowden, who has spoken here before, and I tussle all the time on the internet because Dave mistakenly thinks I'm into social atomism that I think the individual is the most important part of the system. I don't. I actually agree with them because I think it's the complex networks that we as individuals are part of that is so important. We can't let those systems down by not effectively operating as thoughtful individuals. But you know, I worry people sometimes by saying, I've blogged for so long, for so much of the time, that it feels like some of my synapses fire outside my skull and some of them inside. So my thinking, if you like, I feel happens in a social context. So it's quite the opposite of that social atomism. Um, so, uh, I completely agree with you that uh, um, part of the fact that the name artificial intelligence sometimes is misleading because we are just only thinking about software and system that uh, are more power, have more power than probably 10 years ago and is able to do a lot of things. But uh, the use of this kind of artificial brain, if you want to call it in this manner, and internet make connection between them and between biological system, between person, but also between environment, because we don't forget the mythical internet of things. So uh, this kind of uh, system can interact uh, with the environment, with the building, uh, with everything. And so I'm sure that in the next future also, this kind of interaction will be so important. Uh, um, uh, 
not only the human can give the parameters, but also, for instance, the, the, the world that is around. And exactly in the same manner, we become social person and we start to, not to, to live alone, but to, to have uh, any action, uh, thinking about which can be the interaction with the other. I'm, s I'm completely sure that also the software will be flexible and adaptable of the system and that they decide to do different things and depending of the environment, depending of the time, depending of the age, depending of their volunty, because also uh, we didn't talk about the emotion, but we can also teach to a system to become boring or to, to become tired, to become older. So it's something that can be in such a manner learned by example or by rules. So I think that uh, this is one of the topic that in future will be more and more important to how to put together these kind of things so that can be connected very easily. Yes, um, that was answered. Um, I would just make two points. We are complex adaptive systems and at the physiological level we have the limbic brain which all mammals have and that allows a certain connection that's um, without necessarily verbal communication. So it's a question of just because connections exist doesn't mean we, we emerge as a hive mind. Maybe we will, and I don't know, but that's not that I don't think it's a necessary conclusion. And the second minor point is that um, there are lots of terms swirling around this topic, brain, mind, consciousness, sentience, intelligence. They're not interchangeable. I just, it's a kind of note. Um, that, that they all contain different things and I think it makes sense to have clarity about what those terms are or at least I don't think we get clarity I think to at least realize that they contain different meanings and, and cover different topics I won't even go there but it's just occurred to me because mind is something else to brain to intelligence brain is and the outward, so like that is in yeah. such a manner we can use that mm. yeah hi uh, might sound like a cliche question, but nevertheless, to all the panelists, do you think AI will take us to singularity? And what is your prediction when this might happen? Will, will, will AI take yeah. us to the singularity? How? Oh. And if so, when? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know the okay, nobody knows. I mean, I it's. Know. Probably oh, can, that's I can as well uh, as you can, so this is something that uh, is very difficult for us to understand what uh, will happen in the future. I can tell you what's happened in the next five years from the technological point of view, but uh, it's very, very, very difficult to understand how much, for instance, will be the impact of what we are doing now in the society, because there are so many factors that put together, so probably there, there will be also, one problem that is very important now is that most of uh, the research in this area has been done by uh, private companies. Yeah. And uh, we are working at university, uh, but uh, the power of the people at university is not so high, like uh, the power and the capability that the big companies have. So uh, there are so many... Uh, things that you have to, uh, to put together that I'm not, is important. I'm not looking for a rational answer. I'm looking yeah. for a philosophical, emotional answer. Uh, I am an engineer, so you have to do that. <laughs> so so philo philosophically, well, I don't know whether this is philosophically, but because we don't know where the future is going to take us, and um, we don't like being um, out of control or not having control over things, um, well, some of us don't. And so I think it makes sense to focus on things we can control which is things like clarity about what we are doing on our side, what we can do, regardless almost what um, the future brings. Um, ultimately, if the machines will become sentient and more intelligent than us, we, all we can do is just pray <laughs> that, that oh. they won't, they'll keep us as pets. We can maybe. also keep organizing <laughs> State of the Net every year, so we can kind of keep track of this. <clears throat> yeah, we don't, so we don't get sign blind in, yeah. I, I do sometimes think we have an inflated sense of our own importance. You know, it's like when we worry about the planet, the planet's fine, it's us that are screwed. Exactly. You know. <laughs> okay, uh, I guess that uh, our time is almost over. We have probably time for one last question, if there is any. 
Okay, in this case, thank you very much to this amazing panel.